You deserve pleasure. Like you deserve to feel good about yourself and all the things that, all the health benefits that come with pleasure and just the mental benefits and that, you know, this is something you deserve. And I think that it's possible. It does sometimes take a little work and education and experimentation and things like that, but the tools are out there um, now. And, and it's something that if you work at it, it, it's something that usually happens uh, at least in some capacity and you deserve it. So, so go for it. Hi everyone. Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today's episode is all about sexual wellness. And we have Dr. Amy Killen here with us today to talk about a subject that honestly is very difficult for some people to talk about. We want to demystify it because what this podcast is about today is it's about this idea that improving our sexual health and sexual wellness and pleasure is improving our overall wellness too. So it's not something that should be seen as disassociated from our health, it's part of our health. And that's what Amy helps us understand the work and the material and the content that she puts out there. It's a fascinating topic. We get into things that anybody can do at home to improve their overall sexual function and sexual performance. And we talk about the latest advancements and therapies that are out there that doctors like Amy are using to help people with specific challenges that they're working through. It's a fascinating conversation. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, functional medicine, and mindset. I'm your host, Drew Perot, and each week, my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and most importantly, live more. This week's guest on the podcast is Dr. Amy Killen. Dr. Amy Killen is an anti-aging and regenerative physician specializing in sexual optimization, aesthetics, and longevity medicine. Dr. Killen is an international speaker, clinical practice owner, medical director of a national regenerative medicine physician's training course. For all the physicians that are listening and want to get deeper training, she has something to offer there too. She's an author and frequent media guest. She's an outspoken advocate for empowering patients to look and feel their best by merging lifestyle modification, hormone optimization, personalized medicine, and regenerative therapies. Dr. Killen, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. You know, I feel like this topic is one that we've had in mind for a while and something that our guests really care about too. And I heard you in another podcast say that it's kind of crazy we live in this hyper-sexualized world, if you're in the Western world, especially in North America, with ads on TV and in, in the media and everything like that. And yet, the only real education that we get when it comes to sexual wellness and sexual intimacy is a little bit of education in high school in this crash course class, which is really designed to kind of make you scared about getting pregnant, right? right. <laughs> really, that's the goal around it. Some education on contraceptives. Um, and then we kick kids out into the real world and say, okay, go figure it out. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's just crazy. And I think that the topic of sex and intimacy and really thinking of it as something as part of our wellness really takes education, much in the same way that we really leaned into talking about um, mental health and not making it a thing that people have to be worried to talk about. I see your mission as being somebody who really wants to advocate for, for people that sexual health doesn't have to be this thing that we're afraid to talk about. So thank you for your work and thank you for being willing to dive into this podcast with us. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited. I think that uh, you're, you're totally right. It's one of these things that, you know, people talk openly about cardiovascular health and brain health and you know joint health and like the health of almost every part of their body but all of a sudden you mention sexual health and people are like oh like like people like don't want to talk about it um but i think it's really important so i i'm just gonna keep talking about it let's start off with a little bit of the state of the union in terms of really the problem that we're facing so both for men and women who have different you know uh relationships with sex and some of the dysfunctions that might be there or the reasons that are preventing them from experiencing it at the best level. We'll get into some of those details, but give us some of the big picture stats that you've read about and seen when it comes to how much of an issue this really is. So the, the, about, for men, about 40% of men over the age of 40 have some degree of erectile dysfunction. Um, that number goes up by about 10% per decade. So 50% of 50-year-olds, 60% of 60-year-olds, you get the picture. Um, and for women, it's actually shockingly similar. About 40% of women, um, sort of just in general, 
at some point, you know, in the last few years have complained of having sexual problems or sexual dysfunction. So it's almost half of women and, you know, and about half of men over a certain age that are having dysfunction or concerns at least in that department. Um, so I think it's something that is, you know, obvious, it's under talked about because it's actually a really prevalent problem. How often do you see for the patients that you work with, which is both men and women, that um, there is some shame around what they're going through? Yeah. I mean, almost all the time, there's some shame. Um, and, and it's very interesting. You know, I'll have, I'll have patients who, who come in, uh, oftentimes they'll come in alone. Like they don't, they don't have their partner with them most of the time. And some of them haven't even spoken to their partner about the problems that they're having. Um, and that's both men and women. Like that's, you know, they've come in and say, I'm having erectile dysfunction, but I haven't talked to my partner about it. And the same thing for women, I'm having, you know, problems with arousal or orgasm or whatever, and they haven't spoken to their partner. So it's, it's, it's something that people are keeping locked inside and they don't really speak to their partners often or doctors or friends because they, there's some kind of stigma around it. Kind of like you said, kind of like with mental health, it's one of these things where people kind of get in their head that they are supposed to be a certain way. And that if they're not, it's their fault. And, um, and I think that that's very similar to mental health. And zooming out and kind of looking at the world, why do you think that, why do you think that is? Like, what are the factors that are going on that people feel that they're the problem and everybody else has it figured out? Do you have any thoughts? I'm going to have you put on your philosopher hat for a second. You know, yeah. what do you think are the contributing factors that lead to that? You know, I think that certainly the, the, all of the sort of openness in the media, the porn industry, things like that, or which are setting these very um, unrealistic expectations around sex, you know, how, how it should look, how it should be, um, that are, you know, they're just not real. They're just, they're total Hollywood. I think that's contributing. Um, I think that there's this, this idea, um, and, it's, and it's been there for a long time for, for men, that you should be performing. You talk, you talk about male sexual performance, like it's a performance. <laughs> And I think that even just the terminology is, is contributing to the fact that, you know, men feel like they have to perform on the flip side. It's only been in the last decade or so that women have even talked about, you know, if they're enjoying themselves and if it's working for them. Um, so that's something that's relatively new in the past. Women were, you know, kind of told to just kind of sit back and, and let it happen. And, you know, hopefully it doesn't hurt. Um, but I think that we're, we're starting to see some, some new, uh, in the medical field, as well as just in general, people are starting to talk a little bit more about it as being like, this is something that your body is designed to do. And it's important for your relationship. It's important for your general health. Um, and so let's try to optimize sexual health and make you, you know, a happier, healthier person. Let's talk about some of the, in addition to not talking about it, because when we don't talk about it, sometimes myths become pervasive in society. Right. And the myths go unquestioned. And when they go unquestioned, then that can lead to a lot of behaviors, including not addressing it, feeling shameful about it. So I've heard you talk about, and you've even written about some of the common myths that are there uh, that are related to um, sexual health. So can you expand on some of those myths that you share about? Um, well, you know, there are a lot of myths. I think like one of them, like I said, I think is that for instance, for women, there is, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's really a myth or if it's just kind of understood from, you know, from sort of watching other porn and things like that, that women are supposed to be able to have orgasms just from having reg regular vaginal intercourse. Like that's kind of what people think. And so I have all these women who come to my office and they'll say, you know, I I'm not having an orgasm during sex. Um, and, you know, and I, I want to be able to do that. And, and why am I not doing it? And, I, and, I'm, and I'm broken because I can't do it. Um, but it turns out that only 25 or maybe 30%, but probably less of women are actually able to have orgasms from just regular vaginal intercourse. Like most of them need clitoral stimulation to have an orgasm. And this is something that people don't even talk about. And so women, because they're getting their information from, you know, I don't know, Cosmopolitan magazine and, and porn, like they're not actually learning what's real and what's healthy and what's normal. And so that's something that they feel like they're broken if they're not doing things a certain way. When you look at the current state of the society and our diet and our lifestyles, how do those things in our modern life impact sexual health and pleasure that comes along with it uh, for the better or for the worse? Oh my gosh, this is such a big topic. 
<laughs> such a big topic. Um, like we know, for instance, that the way that we're eating in our lifestyle is obviously affecting our health in general. It's affecting our cardiovascular health. So blood flow is not getting where it needs to go. You know, we're, we're more overweight, we're more diabetic, we're more, we have more cardiovascular disease than we ever used to. And all of those things affect your ability to have blood flow and healthy, you know, sexual reactions. We also know that the way that we're eating and diet and lifestyle affects our hormone levels. So we, you know, men now, testosterone levels are significantly lower than they were just 50 years ago. In fact, they're so much lower that they had to the labs in order to compensate for that and make sure that we're still, you know, that the lab is showing sort of the middle 95% of the population. They had to move the reference ranges down um, so that they're still, that, you know, that people in general in the world are still in that 95% sort of middle range, but men's testosterone levels have gone way down, which is contributing to you know, lower sperm count and, and lower you know, erectile dysfunction and, and problems like that. Uh, similarly, you know, women's hormones are also changed as well. So it's the things that we eat, it's what we put in our bodies, it's how, you know, it's basically everything around us changes everything from the way that blood flows to the area, to the way the hormones react, to the way that the nerves are reacting. Like it's a it's really big picture. <laughs> Yeah, I've even heard some uh, doctors and physicians say that in a good way, it's almost like because so much of our cardiovascular health is around that blood flow that if you see as a man that you're experiencing erectile dysfunction, that could almost be an early sign that something is going on, that you want to check out deeper things because we often think of the sexual organs as almost separate from the body, right? It's like, here's our body. And then here's right. this like organ that we have that was just designed yeah. to either it's just urinate. Doing its, own thing. it's just disconnected. Yeah. It's disconnected, but all these things are connected. And so they could be early signs that it's, it's not just if our sexual health or quote unquote performance is off or pleasure isn't there. It's also that this could be connected to something bigger. What, what do you want to tell our audience when it comes to that topic and how important sexual pleasure is to our wellness. Some people don't maybe understand that. Oh gosh, yes. Um, so the first part of that question, absolutely. The, we talk about erectile dysfunction as being sort of the canary in the coal mine, you know, like basically it's an early warning sign of potentially cardiovascular disease primarily, which, you know, blood flow issues. Um, and if you think, and this is true for women as well, although not quite as well studied, but the anatomy is actually very similar. Um, but if you think about blood vessels, uh, you know, they've got a blood vessel. And one of the main things that happens as you get older is you get atherosclerosis, which fills the blood vessel with plaque, you know, which, which is what's going to eventually lead to a heart attack or a stroke. Well, the, the blood vessels that lead to the penis and the clitoris and all of the sexual organs are much smaller than the blood vessels that lead to like the heart of your brain. And so it makes sense that as you start to develop plaque in your blood vessels all over your whole body, those small blood vessels will be affected first and they're going to close up, you know, or get, or get close to close and you have lack of blood flow to those areas. So when we see things like erectile dysfunction or even um, female sexual dysfunction where you're not getting um, clitoral engorgement and arousal and things like that, one of the things we think about is, do they have cardiovascular disease? Is it, is it literally just a blood flow issue? And oftentimes it is, and that's kind of where we want to start with that. So that was kind of the first part of your question. <laughs> yeah, and it might not be that they have full-blown cardiovascular disease. It could be that it's coming, you know, Absolutely. 10, 20 years down the line. This is why you have men and women that are in even their late 20s or early 30s that, or, or mid-30s that you don't have to be a 50-year-old person or 70 or 80 or 90. You can be young and still start to see some of these things, and it could be an indication that something might happen down the road is what I'm hearing, yeah. hearing you say. Yeah. And the other thing that happens, and I definitely want to get to the second part of your question as well, but it's kind of a whole different thing. Yeah. The other thing that happens with age uh, for both men and women, I think is really important with sexual health is that we start losing our ability to make nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is one of my favorite things to talk about because people don't even know what it is. Like, you know, it's, it's not really discussed a lot, but it's basically the main chemical messenger that opens up the blood vessels, that vasodilates the blood vessels. So it basically lets the blood in. So it's important for maintaining your blood pressure. It's important for you know, getting blood to different areas of your body. It kind of can be kind of turned on and turned off. Um, but it, as you can imagine, it's also important for getting blood into the sexual organs. Um, it's actually the main kind of a signal that tells blood to go to the sexual organs and stay there for a period of time. And starting at about age 35, 40, we stop being able to make 
as much nitric oxide, um, which is actually made in your blood vessels. Um, so that kind of goes down and down and down and down and down as you get older. Uh, one of the things that you could do it's very important to do as you get older, and by older I mean you know older than 35 or 40, is start eating foods that your body can make into nitric oxide. And those are things like green leafy vegetables and beets and pomegranate and, and things like that. These are nitrate rich foods um, that can be broken down into nitric oxide in your body because you lose the ability to make it from other, other, other sources. Um, one of the things I talk about a lot in my podcast, which I think is really cool, is that a lot of people use antiseptic mouthwash um, on the you know, like on a regular basis, and that actually it prevents one of the steps. Uh, in your body being able to make nitric oxide from food, so it kills the bacteria in your mouth that are required to turn nitrate rich food into nitric oxide in your body. And there's actually been studies with mouthwash that have shown people who use antiseptic mouthwash have higher blood pressure. You know, there's their poor cardiovascular status, poor sexual status. Like it's a whole, it's just crazy that something that we don't even think about can be affecting not only our sexual health, but like our just general cardiovascular health. So don't use Listerine or any of those mouthwashes. <laughs> <laughs> so key. And, and, and if somebody's really dealing with some like for real bad breath that they like it's an ongoing thing that's less to do with the mouth and might be something related to the, to the gut. Not that it couldn't deal with the mouth. It yeah. could be some, some early gingivitis or some other aspects that are there, but it might also be related to the gut, which could be a good indication to clean up your gut health with uh, with an integrative physician or a functional medicine doctor. Yeah, it's all so tied in. You know, it's all it's all so interconnected, as you say. Um, but so so that's that's these are things that we look at. Like I look at patients. You know, what are the hormone levels? What's testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, um, and how? Because those all affect sexual, you know, in, interest, libido, uh, ability to have normal sexual function. But then you look at other things, like you know, are they using mouthwash frequently? Are they doing other things that can increase nitric oxide, like exercising, which is really important, or using you know, like red light therapy or infrared therapy. There's some things like that that you can actually do to increase nitric oxide. Um, and then how's their cardiovascular status? Like you can you look at the whole body, um, which is why I love sexual medicine so much. Cause to me, it's like this, it's like this portal into being able to look at someone's general health and kind of push them in the right direction. Um, a lot of patients will come to me with a sort of sexual complaint. And as we sort of dive in and look at that sexual complaint, we learn that it's not actually a problem with the sexual organs. It's a problem with the body in general. And once we fix that problem, then, you know, they have better sex, but they're also just healthier. So it's kind of like a sneaky way to make people healthier, which I love. <laughs> yeah. And we could use that a lot more in our society along with the real talk. So going back to the second part of that question that I was asking before, yes, even the idea of like, you know, because sex has both been put on a pedestal in our society and things are hyper sexualized, um, and that can go everything from, you know, uh, the media that we watch and consume both towards men and towards women, right? I remember looking at some of my, my sister's magazines that they would read when they were in like high school and other stuff and like Cosmo and all the different ones that are out there. They're, you just read the cover and what they're advertising and you can right. see how it's, we, we've hyper-sexualized it, but we haven't really educated people. So on that topic of education, how important is sexual pleasure and sexual health for our overall health? What do we get from it? So we get, we get so many things. Um, it's, it's basically important for all aspects of health. When I talk about health, I look at like the sort of six main components of health. So you have physical health and I can, we'll talk about kind of some specific things with that. And there's, there's spiritual health, there's emotional health, there's mental health, there's, uh, environmental health and their social health. So those are kind of the six sort of main types of health or parts of health that are important. And sexual health and sexual function, having a, a happy, successful, you know, um, pleasurable sex life actually impacts all six areas of health. Um, and it's also impacted by all six areas of health. So it kind of goes both ways. Um, so for instance, for cognitive health, we know that people who have active, healthy sex lives, and usually active is defined as something in the realm of maybe once a week having sex, or certainly a couple of times a month. It depends on the studies, but it's not like every day. It's just, you know, it's something that's generally a part of their lives. Um, 
those people tend to have less cognitive decline as they get older. They've done studies with, um, with women and men, uh, but basically looked at women who had, you know, were having sex versus women who had not uh, been having you know, regular active sex. And the ones who were sexually active um, had better cognition. They had less cognitive decline as they got older, which is interesting. They've done look at, they looked at the hippocampus and basically people who were more sexually active uh, tend to have sort of larger, healthier hippocampuses, which is you know, tied to memory and things like that. Um, so it's tied very much to cognitive health. Uh, sex is definitely tied to mental sort of emotional health and that we know that people who, uh, again, have sort of active, healthy sex lives tend to have less anxiety. They tend to have, you know, they feel better about themselves and have better um, sort of self, you know, they, their self What's the word? Self-esteem. Yeah, that word. Like, I was like, um, they'd have higher self-esteem. They still have less anxiety. They sleep better, uh, which of course we know sleep has its own whole other, you know, the benefits of sleep are, we could talk, you know, for about half a day about that. So it helps with sleep. It helps with anxiety. It helps with self-image. Um, and other, lots of other things like like less depression. People are, who are generally having a lot of sex have less depression. So all of that's very important. From a physical standpoint, we know that people who are sexually active tend to have lower blood pressure. Um, they tend to, again, sleep better, which is really important. They tend to have less cardiovascular disease. Uh, there was one study in men, again, who looked at men over a 10-year period of time, men who were having sex at least once a week, I believe. And it, it, at the end of it, they showed that there was actually a 50% reduction in overall mortality in the men who were having regular sex versus the men who were not. Now, there's several things probably tied to that. I mean, you can't just say it's just sex. I mean, maybe they're just more active in general or, you know, they have a better relationship with their partner, et cetera. So, but, but these are pretty big things to, you know, to talk about and to think about. Um, and it's besides, you know, sex is fun, but it also does all this really good stuff for us. You know, on that on that note, I think that one thing that people often wonder about with this topic is that what are some of the, I know you said in, in when I first reached out, you said, listen, I'm not a sex therapist. So like, there's a lot of things that I can't or don't go into, Right. but from an anatomy standpoint, how are men and women different? And what is it important for like the listeners to, to know about of just how sex isn't just about the organs in our body, but also how pleasure is received. Is there things that you talk about with your female patients to help them understand, you know, here's the differences or the distinctions that are important to know that we wouldn't just get in a traditional, you know, high school sex education? I mean, a lot of it's stuff that you kind of learn as you go, certainly as far as, you know, the pleasure and receiving that, that is very different for men and women. And, and, and just and really from person to person, I think, especially for women, um, it's in, that the, the way that people experience pleasure is very different because the nerves that are down the pelvis, they do different things in different women. Like the branching of the nerves, like to the clitoris and all around the pelvis is actually different in different women. And so there's not like a one, like there's not one thing that I can say, you know, works for every Everyone. And that's, I think, something that as women, we have to do a lot of experimentation because there's not like one move or one touch or what, you know, it really is very different from woman to woman, which is a little different than with men. Men are a little bit easier in that way. Um, things are generally wired the same way across both, both men, um, but women are not. So I would just, you know, one thing is don't worry if, if something that you know, does, something doesn't work for you. If, if, this, if this thing works for you and not for your friend or not for anyone else, that's okay. Because it just means that your nerves are wired differently. Um, so it's something that takes some practice and experimentation with. Um, one of the things that I see with women, and this may be off topic a little bit, but I have several patients who come in who are, uh, who are women who, because of whatever, uh, maybe with the way they were raised, maybe they have um, some you know, they had religious backgrounds or things like that where they are, they think that sex is, is bad. And this is true with both men and women, but especially with women, I see this. They think sex is bad. They've been told that their whole lives. And even though they're married and maybe they have a couple of kids and, you know, all of these things, they still kind of think that that's, it's bad. And so I'm not a sex therapist, but I do talk to my patients about the fact that they really have to start to, um, to kind of change the way they think about sex. Because if you think it's bad each time you're doing it, um, even subconsciously, then obviously you're not going to have a, you know, a good experience. What, one thing that's interesting with women especially is that there's, um, there's this interesting tie-in between the mental component and the physical component that's a little bit different than with men. Um, 
you know, you really have, women really have to be in the right space mentally to be able to enjoy sex and have orgasms uh, and such. Whereas men, they, they do as well, but it's not to the same degree as women. I tell, I tell my, you know, women, like basically, you know, libido and sex drive for women starts like in the morning. Like when, if the dishwasher is not unloaded and there's like, if the house is a mess and if the, you know, if there's like junk all over the floor, like all of a sudden that, that like sh- that stress alone can kind of turn off their um their arousal and interest in sex that can last the whole day like it really does start early with women and it's a whole mental thing whereas with men it's not quite the same it's a little bit less um broad (laughs) for men (laughs) so women are a little trickier that way yeah and i think it's important to you know you touched on two important themes that i want to highlight the first theme um is that communication is so key because people's bodies are different men women any kind of gender that somebody is, everybody experiences pleasure differently. And this goes back to the first topic that we started about. It's just that because sex is supposed to be something that's pleasurable, part of that pleasure, especially if we're experiencing with another person, is communication around and experimentation, right? right? Being open to trying things, being open to discovering and saying what's there and what, you know, what doesn't work and what works for everybody individually and not thinking that you have to be like somebody else. And the second component are around, um, around uh, belief systems and that often, again, generalizing here, but that typically you hear it a lot from our listeners that women tend to deal with more so than men. If we, don't, if we think that something is inherently bad, just like if we think that it's bad to make money, we're going to feel bad about making it. Even if that means that we're employing people and doing great work or coming up with a product that the world really needs and that they're happy to pay for, that money is just a value exchange. So it's not inherently bad or good. We can use it for those things. So we think that sex is bad and we have a lot of belief systems towards that. It's going to be hard for our body to get behind us and want to perform, even if it's something that we think that we want to get better at doing. Yeah, absolutely. Your, your, your brain has to completely buy into it uh, before, especially for, for women again. I mean, it's true for both, but it really has to, there has to be this buy-in from your brain that this is like not only enjoyable, but it's healthy and it's good for me and it's good for my relationships and it's good for my, you know, like you have to convince the little inner parts of your brain that it's really good for you and really healthy. I think sex is very interesting. It's this very powerful thing. Um, and, and I'm reminded of a, and again, for women, I think especially, there's a lot of um, sort of taboo about talking about sex and enjoying sex and things like that. I was giving a talk in in Italy two years ago for AFEST, and it ended up on YouTube afterwards, which was great. It got a bunch of views, but there were like thousands of comments and probably half of the comments were people like directed at me saying like just negative angry things like you're such a nymphomaniac oh no you're a total prude you don't know anything or you know like basically back at all like all kinds of things that were completely unrelated and I was just thinking if I had given a similar talk on like you know cardiovascular health or brain health or whatever like you'd get some like heckling probably but I think it's because it's a woman talking about sexual health um, on a public forum that people are just like, you can't do that. Like they're just, it, it strikes a chord in people. And I think that that's really telling about how we feel about sex, especially in women, you know, talking about sex or enjoying sex or, or that. We still have a long way to go in that regard. Yeah. It's almost like they're projecting upon you that, and I didn't see the video or the comments, but I can imagine because I've seen similar things that are there and I follow you on Instagram. It's the projection of, you're a freak. You shouldn't be talking about this. You know, there's something wrong with you right. uh, that's there. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. So, you know, I've shared with you that our podcast is majority women. It's probably about 70, 75% women that listen to it. And I think that everybody has a story around wanting to explore their own sexuality and being told that it was dirty, that it was wrong, that there was something bad or inherently unreligious Uh, or incorrect about them wanting to do it, especially as a woman. Yeah. And and yeah, and it's really tricky. And I think that it's also important, you know, there's um, just understanding the physical part of, of sexual health is actually just 
health and maintaining sexual health and maintaining relations. Like if you think about it as being just one more aspect of being healthy, I think it becomes a little bit easier to, for some, for some reason, for some of us to, to be okay with it. Um, so that's part of my message is, is not, you know, like I love that you're enjoying yourself and that you're having pleasure and that's all super important. Um, but also this, is potentially making you healthier that you're doing these things and you're having these, you know, this relationship and your, this closeness and, and even just the hormones that are released and things like that. So um, I try to sort of convey it to patients that it's not, you know, it's, it's a good thing to at least think about it, at least think about maintaining the health of these, these tissues and organs um, as you get older. So part of the solutions and things that you talk about in terms of things that people can do is that there's some stuff that everybody can do at home, right? Like you said, it can be either starting or stopping. And then there's some more innovative and new therapies that are out there that you're highlighting so that people know that they're an option that's available to them. So we'll get to the new and innovative therapies because I want to talk about that. That's there. But you've already shared some things that people can do at home that we that aren't directly related to your sexual organs, but actually have something to do with your overall health and your sexual health. So the first category within that was things that we can stop doing or be more mindful of the impact. So we talked about, um, we talked about uh, diet, but I want to come back to that uh, more specifically. And you talked about just even something as simple as mouthwash, right? I want to hit a few other categories that I know you've had commentary on and, and talk about that and how that relates to it. So one of the first things that I want to talk about before we get back into diet is alcohol. So I want to talk about alcohol. You really, you recently wrote a post about it on Instagram. We know from the numbers on pandemic that alcohol sales are like up by 30 to 40% in different states that are out there. And so I want to understand and what impact does alcohol have when it comes to our sexual performance? And also you can throw in as a bonus. I know you're very passionate about skin and you can add that into the mix too. Yeah. I mean, alcohol is, it's, you know, first of all, I enjoy alcohol. I like to have a little wine here and there. So I'm not bashing people who drink at all, but alcohol is a toxin. Like it's a hundred percent a toxin in our body that we really want to keep at a general minimum. Um, it's, it's high in sugar, which is one thing that I talk about, you know, with diet that is really, it's, you know, sugar is like the root of most evil when it comes to causing inflammation in our bodies. Um, and certainly alcohol is generally high in sugar. So you've got this increased inflammation, which is bad for sex. It's bad for skin. It's bad for everything. Um, and then alcohol also has a depressive effect um, on your on neurologic systems. It you know, makes you sleepy, et cetera. But it also makes it harder in a lot of cases to, to be able to, um, to complete sort of sexual you know, experiences, to have orgasms, things like that. A little bit of alcohol can sometimes be helpful because it can decrease you know inhibitions and make you a little bit more likely like a little bit at, like like get you kind of out of your head a little bit um but after depending on the person after a couple of drinks or maybe it's three or four or five um that turns around and all of a sudden you you really you know become it's it becomes very difficult to complete sexual acts um, because you have this depressive inhibitory effect from the alcohol so uh, it's one of those things that is uh certainly in the short term can be problematic for sex because you may not be able to have sex if you've drank, you know, had too much alcohol. But in the long term, just the over, you know, the, the, the liver damage, the, the extra sugar and glycation of different organs, the extra inflammation, um, all of that adds up over time. And, and that can be really problematic as well. Yeah. And just like you were saying before, the impact on the cardiovascular health and blood vessels and the flow because of the inflammation and the damage that occurs, all those things add up over a period of time. You talked about sugar right? Just anything additionally you want to highlight? Is that something that you work with your patients on? You're like, look, if sexual health and pleasure is something that you're dealing with as a challenge, we, we really got to look at your sugar intake. Yeah, sugar. And when I say sugar, I don't just mean like table sugar. Uh, you know, I basically mean anything that gets turned into sugar directly in your body. So that's, you know, any of the simple carbohydrates, that's your bowl of rice, that's your, you know, your bowl of cereal in the morning that my kids still eat, even though I tell them not to, um, you know, but it's basically sweets plus any kind of simple carbohydrates because all of it gets turned into sugar, which is, you know, again, you've got sugar leads to inflammation, which, you know, people talk a lot about inflammation, but this is really bad uh, for sexual 
performance in sexual organs um, because it does lead to more atherosclerosis. It leads to the cells uh, in the sexual organs becoming, uh, turning into, into less active types of cells, which is kind of interesting. Um, it also leads to hormonal changes and hormonal abnormalities. So for instance, in men, we know that men who tend to have higher sugar intakes, as well as men who tend to be more overweight, tend to have lower testosterone levels, which is directly tied to libido. It's directly tied to erectile dysfunction. Um, so, you know, it messes up your hormones in a way that is problematic and, and over time can lead to obesity, which also does all the same kinds of things, you know, but it just ramps up the inflammation. So it's just like this, you know, it's this chicken and egg effect, but basically sugar is, is it's really bad. It's a little bit, a little bit here and there is okay, but it's one of those things you really have to look at it as something that is, is not helping your body. I want to add in one of the component on the dietary side, and this is really around personalization. Um, I come from a South Asian background and uh, genetically through a few uh, genes that are there, other stuff, I don't process saturated fats and I can't break them down as well as let's say some of my other peers that may not come from that background. And so an interesting thing, and this is all part of like being open and having honest discussions about this is that I noticed that when I, in my current relationship early on, that I, after having not been in a relationship for about a year and a half, I had noticed that I was having some erectile dysfunction. I thought, I'm 36, I'm 35, like this is really weird, like what's going on? And then it was right around the time period that I hadn't gotten some recent blood work done. And in that last uh, year and a half, I had gone towards a lot more saturated fat in my diet, MCT oil, you know, beef, other things like that, grass-fed yeah. beef, all things that people talk about that could be really beautiful for them. And it was through there that I learned that I'm not breaking down saturated fats as well. I'm having a lot more of it show up in my uh, blood that's there, which again, that's, I've done many episodes about how we don't need to worry about that at the extreme that they're worried about in traditional medicine. But for me, basically the doctor was like, you may not be having as good of blood flow and that could lead to later challenges on. And again, here's how we want to tweak that. And in tweaking that and adjusting my fats and the ones that I was intaking, it was almost like within a matter of a couple of weeks, I noticed a complete difference and I didn't have that uh, dysfunction anymore that I was dealing with. So that's just another yeah. thing to add in. I was eating a healthy diet. I don't have a lot of sugar. It's just another thing to add into the mix of how people deal with things a little bit differently. Yeah. So two points on that. I love that story, by the way. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it, yeah, I think that genetics is, and we're learning obviously that it's more, it's more and more important that, you know, for now than, than it used to be even in that we can actually tell from do, doing different kind of testing, what kind of diet maybe is better for you or worse than you, for you and, and how you make hormones and how you detoxify. And there's lots of things that we can learn from genetic testing. So I definitely recommend if you can do it uh, to think about doing some of these functional genetic tests to learn more about how, you know, how your body specifically works, because there's no one diet that works for everyone. I think sugar in general is not good for most people. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, people always ask me like, what's the best diet? And it really is very variable. Um, on the flip side of what the problem that you were having is uh, you actually do need need, you know, good fats uh, and cholesterol to be able to make your sex hormones. And some people um, like me, I have, I have a genetic thing where I have very, very, very low cholesterol and um, I just don't make very much. And it's one of those things that if I, if I didn't eat some fat here and there that, uh, you know, I wouldn't actually be able to make testosterone and estrogen and progesterone and, and all of these important hormones. So working with someone who knows about this is really important. And just keep in mind that whatever your friend is doing with his or her diet may not work for you. And if it doesn't work for you, you know, kind of keeping a catalog and, and changing things up can make a huge difference. You know, I have, I have a lot of 35 year old men who have erectile dysfunction and, and they don't know why. And, you know, you're, you have to do, you know, we start with looking at lifestyle, making some little changes here and there, adding in some exercise, losing some weight, you know, adding in branched chain amino acids or some vitamin D or, you know, zinc, selenium, like things like that. We can start with that um, and then move more towards more invasive things later on. But, um, but there's no reason that you, you know, can't at least understand what's going on if you go through, you know, enough testing and such. Totally. And uh, maybe I'll do a, more of an episode and expand on some of those uh, tests and things that I did. So, but just for clarification for the audience is that I still have a lot of fats in my diet. I still include a lot of things. I was just modifying maybe the Absolutely. level of saturated fat that I was having yeah. uh, to optimize a few things, including blood flow that are there. So uh, you also talked about, so you talked about 
including certain foods, right? Nitrate and certain vegetables that would support that. Are there any other things that we want to be thinking about including that are related to our overall health, but also might help us out with blood flow and uh, sexual pleasure? You mean in diet or in just- In diet, <laughs> yeah. Is there food? Is there supplements that you think about adding in the category of things that people can yeah. do from home uh -huh. that are available to them that um, would support them in this process? I mean, in general, you know, a lot of sort of heavy plant-based diet, lots of vegetables are going to be very helpful. Making sure you're getting enough vitamin D is, is super helpful because you need vitamin D to make a lot of your sex hormones. Um, so whether that's from the sun or from food or, you know, whatever the source is, uh, vitamin D, we know is important for a lot of things, but it's also important for sexual health. Um, making sure you're getting enough protein, that's something else that's really important for being able to, to make the proteins and to, um, to make the hormones uh, and to kind of get the blood where it needs to go a lot of some especially i see some women especially that you know are on very lower they're on low protein diets you know maybe vegans or vegetarians who are just not watching protein as much but that's something that can really affect everything from sex to skin to hair to you know all kinds of energy etc um and and then like i said like good fats i think are really important um those are the main things I think about. There are lots of there are lots of vitamins and supplements that can play a role, but it, it's very dependent on the person. You you know you can get micronutrient testing and check for those micronutrients like selenium and zinc and things like that and see if you have enough. I wouldn't tell everyone to go take those things because you may be just fine. Again, all about personalization and people dialing in and and using it as an, a good excuse in a way to get you excited about transforming your overall health. If you have right. challenges in that area, or in some cases, belief systems or past traumas that somebody might went through there that have a blockage that's there, not right. allowing them to experience pleasure. So again, you know, you can work with an appropriate uh, practitioner on, a, on addressing those areas. Let, let's talk about some of the more innovative uh, tools that you practice and apply at your um, centers that have come into uh, existence really in the last like, you know, five, maybe 10 years that maybe not everybody uh, knows about. So is there one that you want to start off with? Um, yeah, so I do a lot of work with regenerative medicine and regenerative medicine basically means trying to get your own body to, you know, to improve itself and kind of to heal itself. Uh, we do a lot of work with like platelet rich plasma and stem cells and exosomes and other biologics, which are all things that essentially we can inject into the genitalia, which sounds awful, but it's not that bad. Um, after using some numbing cream and we can basically, we're trying to send, sort of kind of send signals to the cells that you already have in that area to increase increase blood flow, increase blood vessel formation, maybe, maybe repair nerves, maybe, you know, change, uh, kind of change the tissue in there to regenerate it and make it a little bit more youthful and better functioning. So we can use these different therapies. These are simple, like, you know, outpatient procedures that I do in both men and women, um, where we're injecting, you know, some or all of these components, these regenerative uh, components into, um, for women, it's the vagina and the clitoris, for men, it's into the penis. And um, over time, over two or three months, or even more, uh, oftentimes we'll see improvements in in sensation, in blood flow, in, um, you know, in arousal, orgasm. And in women, actually, a lot of times we'll see improvements in stress urinary incontinence, which is like when you kind of cough or sneeze and you pee a little bit and you can't jump on a trampoline because you pee a little bit. Like we, we can actually sometimes help with that just by doing some little bitty injections into those areas. So that's one of my, that's one of my favorite tools. Um, and then I usually pair that with um, some kind of energy device as well. So for women, I use uh, like either vaginal lasers or vaginal radio frequency devices where we're heating up the, the tissue um, to induce collagen formation and, and help kind of support the structures a little bit better, get more blood flow in there. And then for men, I often use uh, gains wave or shockwave therapy, which is uh, using high energy sound waves to, again, kind of do the same kind of repair and regeneration of those uh, tissues. So let's talk about the, the women first, and then we'll get to the men. So in the case of stem cells, or let's talk about stem cells and then lasers uh, next, what is the, what contributed to the problem? I'm putting problem in quotes here. I'm just saying, what contributed to the problem? What are some of the factors that are there? And, and you talked about it overall in terms of increasing blood flow that, but what specifically are stem cells doing that would help fix that problem? So it depends on the person, obviously. It depends on kind of what's causing the problem. And, and I'm assuming when these, with these procedures, these are patients who generally, um, you know, 
we think that everything else is, is generally working well. Like, so you've, already not- worked on the diet, you've already worked yeah. on the hormones, yeah. other components. Yeah. And so it's really maybe more localized that they're not able to, what, just pick a classic like, case study. They're coming in yeah. and they're saying that they can't experience pleasure like at the same not, level. They're not able to orgasm since they had a baby or maybe they are not just not as sensitive after, after they've gone through menopause. And even though they're on hormones now, they're still you know not having sensitivity or maybe the vaginal tissues have um, kind of, there's some laxity, it's, you know, some stretch that they didn't used to have and they're trying to um, build that up. Or, or maybe like I have a lot of postmenopausal women who have experienced uh, vaginal atrophy where the, you know, the vaginal tissue essentially thins. And so it, sex becomes painful and you, you don't have the normal mucosa that, that, that you had when you were younger. Um, so it's, it could be any very, you know, any of these things or, or any others. But what we're trying to do basically is kind of, and I say this in sort of a tongue in cheek way, but kind of turn back time a little bit. Reverse and- the aging. It's almost like there's been some aging that's happened. This can happen right. both for men, women, anybody. Yeah. There's been some aging that's happened in a, in a localized manner. It could be from lifestyle, stress, combination, just living, everyday living. right. And now you're trying to address that. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, exactly. So the, these therapies, the way that they work, and I will say to just to start off, these are all still considered to be very investigational. So this is not something that that um, certainly it's being done. A lot of you know it's being they're being done, but it's not something that you're going to find everywhere because we're still kind of figuring out. They're very safe therapies, but they're still they're still considered very investigational. But um, so for instance, stem cells, the way that we would use them uh, in a in a woman whatever age is, we would generally do a either a bone marrow aspiration where we just take a little bone marrow from her or do a little liposuction where we get a little bit of fat from, from like the love handle area. Um, just in an outpatient procedure, we isolate the stem cells from that. And then we inject those stem cells from the same patient, you know, into the clitoris, into the anterior vaginal wall, which is right underneath the urethra and kind of where the G spot is, which is not a real thing, but that's kind of where that is. Um, and we inject into that area. And, and then over time, what we, what we see is that you have sort of a, a, a increase in the collagen production in the, the vaginal wall. We can see an increase in blood vessel formation uh, going to the clitoris. Um, we can see, you know, increase in support structures and less, less uh, vaginal dryness. And so you're kind of, you're kind of turning the time, you know, the clock back a little bit and, and trying to repair some of the damage that has been done with aging um, in a way that's using the person's own body. Cause all we're doing is getting your body to kind of turn back on certain signals that haven't been working as well because you've gotten a little older. Um, so it's really, it's kind of this interesting hack where you're, you know, we're, we're using tools that are, that are really coming from the patient a lot of times or most of the time to help the patient to heal and become a little bit younger in certain areas. Yeah. And right now you mentioned that a lot of these modalities, there's very few practitioners, right. That are, that are practicing them. But the hope is by bringing awareness to it and, and showing options, like all things it want, you know, I started on my gluten-free, low sugar, you know, dairy-free diet 20 years ago because I had really bad acne and every. But back then was like, gluten, what is gluten? Like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> but then you talk about things, you do them, and now there's so many companies, there's so many products, it's more accessible to, to people. So that is the, the hope that this becomes something that more individuals do. Yeah. And, um, and you also do some training for some physicians if they want to learn how to incorporate this into their practice. Mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll talk about that and how they could reach out to you. So let's, so the laser that you had mentioned, right? What would be the reason that you'd bring that uh, into uh, as a treatment option for somebody? So there's all different lasers out there. And a lot of OBGYNs that are using lasers and radio frequency devices. This is something that's a lot easier to find. Um, but there's, there's CO2 lasers and there's um, other, other types of uh, lasers as well as radio frequency. But what they're all doing in some capacity is they're heating up the, the vaginal canal um, with either light or with radio frequency. And that heat basically signals your body that there's been some sort of damage. And when you're, when you're damaged, your body is like, oh, I got to fix that damage. And so, you know, it's the same kind of idea as the regenerative injections in that your, your body is like, oh, well, if there's been some damage, I should increase collagen production in this area. I should increase blood flow to this area because I got to heal the damage. Um, I should, you know, I should get the nerves to start working because we got we to gotta fix it. So it's basically uh, a, a, an injury that is created that's 
you know, could usually, it could be, it's usually very mild, but your body reacts by repairing the area. So these are lasers that usually are pretty fast, simple, you know, maybe 10 minute procedures, depending on the type of laser we're using. Um, you treat the whole vagina because you can go all the way in and you treat the whole entire thing. And then depending on what type of device is being used, some of them treat superficially only, some of them go a little bit deeper, um, but we're treating things like uh, vaginal dryness, for instance, or lack of lubrication, um, vaginal laxity, where you've had some loose of the vaginal muscles and tissues and you want to see if you can help to make that um, a little bit tighter. Um, we're treating a uh, lack of sensation sometimes that can be helpful. These can be really helpful as well for the stress urinary incontinence. So the same thing, you know, the kind of peeing a little bit when you don't mean to, because if you can build that tissue up, that's just underneath the urethra, then it can make a big difference in, in that, in that response. And it's, it's not invasive, you know, it's, it's an easy procedure out in the doctor's office. Usually you do, depending on the device, you may do two or three of them over a couple of months, but you know, you basically walk in, you walk out and um, there's no downtime or restrictions for a lot of these. So it's something that's very simple. It's a tool that has, is being used more and more by, um, by OBGYNs, which I am not, as well as uh, some other people who are in this field as a way to help repair some of those tissues inside. Let's pivot over to some of the tools that you use for a man, especially in the category of like erectile dysfunction. You talked about some shockwave therapy. So can you explain that and what you're trying to, what, what problem you're trying to solve? Yeah, it sounds scary, right? Shockwave therapy, <laughs> but it's not. Um, so, so there's a couple. So, shockwave therapy. Are, so, the, the full name is low intensity extracorporeal shockwave therapy. So, if you look in the papers, if you want to like look this stuff up, um, there's about 10 years worth of data just in treating erectile dysfunction using this shockwave therapy. Um, in the United States, there's a company called Gainswave, which um, I've, I'm affiliated with, and they have a, a sort of a protocol that they use for their shockwave therapy. But it's, it's all under this umbrella of shockwave therapy. Um, the way that it works is we're basically sending high pressure sound waves into the penis. And those sound waves, again, cause this sort of micro trauma, which is not very much, it's very minimal, but the trauma then sets off this biological cascade where it essentially sends out growth factors and, and you get increased blood vessel formation over time. You get increased local nitric oxide, which we've already talked about. So we know that's really important for blood flow. You can get nerve regeneration. You can get even some breaking up of plaque potentially in those blood vessels. Um, and you do a series of treatments. You Usually it's at least six treatments over the course of like maybe three weeks. Um, they take about 30 minutes each. And, and, then, and then you wait a little while and we see improvements in um, blood flow, erections, you know, improvements in symptoms of erectile dysfunction. Probably about half of my men who do these treatments though don't actually have ED. They're just in that kind of 35 to 45 or 50 year old range. And they're like, you know, what can I do that's maybe preventative? Because if we, if we know it's helping with blood flow and nerves and things like that, um, we think potentially that it's going to help stave off ED later on. So I have a lot of patients who just do it for that purpose. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a pretty cool treatment. A, like 40 plus studies have been done on it that have shown it's safe and effective. And I think you will see a lot more of this in the U S in the next few years. Let's zoom out for a second and talk about hero's journey. How did you end up in this place <laughs> that this was a specialty that you developed in helping people experience more pleasure and really being an advocate for this topic. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I had, so I was an ER doctor. I was emergency medicine trained. I worked in the emergency department. I went through residency for emergency medicine. I was an ER doctor for about 10 years. Um, towards the end of that, there was a lot going on. I had three kids within two years and just tons of stress, tons of bad diet decisions, tons, you know, like basically I was like kind of imploding on myself, um, becoming just, you know, more and more uh, sick in general. And, and I, I, I realized that I, this was happening. And I also started seeing a lot of patients that were coming into the ER with these chronic medical problems, which we talk about all the time that, you know, we really couldn't address. And I just sent them on their way, you know, day after day. So I eventually transitioned into integrative medicine where I was starting to learn about, you know, treating the body at the root cause and, and this kind of thing, doing a lot of hormone um, optimization, et cetera. And, and would you say that that came from making changes in your own health or different decisions? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was me getting to a point where I realized that I couldn't 
keep going through this high stress life with lack of sleep and, you know, bad foods and no exercise. And I was just not a, I wasn't healthy and I was a miserable person to be around um, at the time. So I realized that I had to help myself. And I also wanted to be able to help all these patients that were, that had come into the ER that I had sent home, you know, for 10 years um, without any real tools because I didn't have them. I didn't have time to, to teach them anyway. Uh, but that they also had these chronic medical problems, which a lot of it was just stemming from stress or it was stemming from, you know, poor lifestyle choices that I thought I could um, make a difference in my life and in their life if I learned some of these tools. So I basically just cut ties with the ER. I kind of walked away one day, um, went into integrative medicine and was doing that for about a year when um, I started seeing that what was happening a lot was I'd have these patients, men and women, they would come in with, you know, all of these problems, all these chronic medical problems, and we would start working on them and get them where they had this foundation of health. They were feeling a little better, their energy's better, they're starting to lose weight, their depression's better, like they're feeling better, they're out of like survival mode. But then they would come back and say, thank you so much for helping me with that. And can you either help me now with my sex life or with my skin? And I heard it like so many times, that was kind of like their like next level health questions. Um, but I was, I started realizing I need to learn some things that I can do that's sort of out of the box to help these people with their sex or their skin or both. And that's how I got into it. It's a very weird, um, it's a, it was a weird path, but I love it. Cause I think it's so, I think it's so important, um, to talk about all of these things. And I love how it all impacts overall health, which is, which is really the overall goal is to get someone to be healthier overall. So we can, you know, live longer, live better, et cetera. In this period of time where you were stressed out and maybe making not the best lifestyle decisions and you just did what you knew how at that time, did you also notice a connection? And again, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, we'll cut it out. But did you notice a connection with your own libido that when your health and your stress and other stuff that your own interest in, in, in sex and intimacy changed a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's actually kind of a funny story that like, whenever I think about that period, I have this one like moment that flashes in my head. Um, so my husband who had been living out of town for a while, cause he was doing some work out there. He was home um, for a weekend. And I, I remember my, my daughters who were, I think four at the time, they had to both come down with lice. So I had these two like curly headed twin girls who have like heads full of lice and we'd been battling it for weeks. It was disturbing, but we finally had this person, this lice whisperer person um, who came in and essentially got rid of the lice after a lot of money and a lot of hours. But she told us that going forward, we had to start doing lice checks on each other. Like all of us, even though we didn't all have it, you know, I had to check my husband's hair. He had to check mine. Like we had to all do these lice checks every day. So, so one day we're sitting on like the playroom steps and I was kind of sitting below him, like kind of with his, you know, in between his legs, he's, he's looking for, you know, lice eggs in my hair, like sectioning my hair and looking for lice eggs. And all of a sudden it struck me that this was the most intimate that we had been with each other in like months. Oh, wow. And it was while he was looking for lice eggs in my hair. <laughs> and it was, it was very, it was kind of like comedic and also really depressing at the same time. So, so absolutely like that. I think that that was, um, that was a moment that I, for some reason stuck with me. And as I started getting healthier, I looked back at it and I was like, well, of course you didn't you weren't thinking about sex, like you were literally in survival mode. And I think that that's where a lot of people are. They're in this survival mode, whether it's with their jobs or their, you know, their families are stressed or whatever it is where they're just dealing with like trying to stay afloat and they can't even imagine thinking about like that next level of health. Um, but, but I want to get people to where they can start thinking about it and they can actually achieve that. Mm, that's great. And thank you for being open for that because I think the thing is that when practitioners, especially doctors, come on this podcast and talk about their own struggles in a particular area and how they're human beings and they went through it, it gives people who are listening a sigh of relief of like, oh, it's not just me who went through something. It's, you know, even people that have the tools and have the information, they can go through this sometimes too, and they can be as affected by yeah. the, the factors that are, that are going on. So you talked about skin and you know, obviously skin is something that people care about and they want to have the best skin possible. And our self-confidence and our, our, our looks and our own sense of self-image plays a lot into our, our ability to experience pleasure, right? They're, they're very connected in that way. Mm -hmm. And um, skin is actually a really interesting topic for me because as I was mentioning to you before, I was in high school and grew up on like a very like standard Indian, like um, Indian American, 
you know, vegetarian diet, which meant that I was eating everything except for meat, which meant a lot of chips, a lot of soda, a lot of things right. like that. And occasionally some Indian food that my parents would get <laughs> home when we would have dinner. And through that process of eating a lot of pasta and dairy and other stuff, I, got, I developed really bad acne in uh, high school. And I graduated about 20 years ago in the year 2000. And all through high school, I had braces and really bad acne. And it was a very just terrible thing. Right. Uh, for me. And I know just ha from having gone through that, when people feel that their skin is off, how much it just affects them and how much it, it, it makes a difference in their life. So um, talk to us about skin and what is it that you want people to know about when it comes to about the topic of skin and, and what's possible when it comes to improving it? So what's interesting about this whole, because I, I talk to people about, I'm, I do skin and sex is what I say. And people are like, how are those even related? But it turns out that almost everything we've discussed already, like all the preventative stuff, all of the lifestyle stuff, even a lot of the therapies and things that we can do to help um, with sexual function, all of that applies to skin health as well. So, I mean, it's, it's, we can literally go back to everything we've talked about and it all applies to having healthier skin. So that's everything from, you know, avoiding sugar and eating healthy diets and getting good fats to getting exercise and getting, you know, making sure your stress is controlled and low, making sure you're sleeping and, you know, all of those core uh, sort of foundational health things apply to both sex and skin. So it's easy for me to kind of talk about both with patients because there's so much overlap. I mean, it's weird, but there's so much overlap. And even a lot of the therapies and treatments that, that we can use for these regenerative and integrative um, things that are out there from the stem cells and PRP to the lasers to um, other energy devices, radio frequency, et cetera, also works on the skin. And so there's a lot of the same tools that I can use kind of for both. Um, but like, but what, what you said is, is I think very true. I think that the way we feel about ourselves um, for better or worse affects our sex life and our sex lives. And the fact if we're having sex and, and having, you know, pleasure and orgasm, that actually also affects our skin. And so there's actually quite a bit of uh, some interesting research out there that, you know, that basically shows again, like, you know, if you're having more sex and you're sleeping more, that your skin is healthier and it's brighter and it's more, it's more youthful and some of the same hormones that are released, some of the oxytocin and, and serotonin and things like this that are released during uh, an estrogen released during sex can be really beneficial for skin. So they both help each other. If you can, you know, if you can get them both teed up, then they'll kind of feed each other in a positive way, skin and sex. I love that. Are there any of, so, so I knew that when we were doing this podcast with you and I let the audience know that, you know, this is coming up, they said, we got to ask her about Botox because that's <laughs> something that a lot of people, especially in the wellness world uh -huh. to know about is, you know, is it, what, what are your thoughts on it? Is it okay? Is it not okay? Are there better solutions that are out there and should be worried about Botox? Um, you know, I think, and I get this question a lot, actually, from sort of people in this space, because people are obviously very worried about, about ex introducing extra toxins to the body. And it's clearly a toxin. I mean, it is a toxin. But, but so far, it's not been shown to be dangerous long term. Um, Botox is probably one of the safer things that, um, that we do in uh, aesthetic medicine. It's something that if, you know, it, you can have a, a sort of bad side effect, like you can't have an eye that's drooping like this, or, you know, like you could have some asymmetry or, or whatever, but it only lasts for a couple of months because the way that it works is actually uh, the, the, the toxin prevents um, one particular protein from working, but it, it only does that for a few months because that protein regenerates. And so it's, you know, you may have three or four or five months, um, but eventually that protein regenerates and, and that nerve is getting the you know sending out the the signal and the muscle starts working so it's it you know side effects are possible but not not permanent um it, very 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 few people have had any long-term problems with botox and that's usually people who have some kind of spasticity disorder like um, they've had strokes and they have spastic muscles and they're getting really really high doses of botox that's the only people that i know of who've ever had um serious problems or or death from botox so it's super safe um, as far as long-term data, you know, we've had it around um, for more than, what, 20 years or so now. So it's something that we've had for a while. Uh, we, I can't say for sure that there's not some kind of build up over time that could be problematic, but we haven't seen it yet. Um, I think that as far as people, you know, I feel, I feel like if you're comfortable with it, you know, then go for it. I think it could be really helpful to help 
prevent wrinkling. Um, but I have a lot of patients who are not comfortable with it and don't want to do it. And I think that there are some other things out there. They don't do the exact same thing, but they can help, um, you know, some of the regenerative things, the lasers, good skincare, avoiding sun, um, all of this can help your skin stay healthier for longer if you don't want to do Botox. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, you know, there's Viagra is, is reported to be very safe, but the challenge becomes if you're using it as just um, a Band-Aid and you're not addressing the root issues that are there, you may actually be masking some deeper stuff that are going on, like your cardiovascular health. I, I did see a, a study come across recently, like I think it was about a year ago, year and a half ago, that there may be some concerns around people being able to experience emotions because our face, did you mm -hmm. see Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw that. To it, that there was a, that they were saying inside the study that maybe people who are getting Botox, that their face is not moving in the same way, so their body doesn't experience those same emotions and internally. Um, any thoughts on that? You know, I don't, I, I think it's an interesting question. I don't think that there's any, I don't think that's for sure it's been, that that's been proven by any means. I will say that it, it can go the other way, that certain people, like people who get a lot of stress headaches um, and, you know, and tension headaches, that when you do Botox and you actually stop their ability to like, you know, wrinkle these muscles and kind of tighten up these areas, that they actually have improvements in their headaches because they can't make the facial expressions that cause stress. So I, I you know, I can see where it could go both ways. I can see where it's possible that not being able to make certain expressions could affect, you know, your mental health. I, ha I haven't seen it. Um, I'm not convinced of it yet, but I think it's interesting. Yeah. And I think like uh, a lot of things over time, we'll, we'll figure it out. And, you know, the yeah. good thing is, is that there's, there's a lot that we can do that if somebody has issues with it, you know, like on a personal level, I probably wouldn't get Botox, you know, just, I have my own generalized concerns. You know, everybody's different. Yeah. And, but I hear, like to hear from you experts who are out there who are like, look, the data that we have so far is that it's safe. You know, here's the considerations, you know, and that there's plenty of things that we can do that are there that can support us in that yeah. process without having to tap into it if we don't feel comfortable with it. Yeah, and I think that's true with any of the aesthetic stuff, right? Anything. Like, I would never tell someone that you, like, you know, that you need this or you need that treatment or, you know, like, it's all, it's all about how you feel about yourself. And I, I more than anything want people to feel good about themselves and feel confident. And, you know, if that means, you know, doing nothing at all and, and just, you know, eating well and avoiding the sun, fantastic. Like I'm, I'm super happy for you. Um, but some people that's not enough and they, they don't feel great about themselves. Um, you know, I have, I have women especially who are professionals, you know, I've had teachers or other professionals who, as they get older, and this is horrible and I'm not advocating it, but as they get older, they feel like they're not taken seriously anymore. They don't feel like they are given the respect that they, you know, that they were given before. Um, and it's because they, they think that because their face is showing signs of aging, and I hear this all the time, that, that they're not getting the respect in their job that they once did. And so for them, um, you know, for right or for wrong, they, they feel better and they feel like they are perceived as being, um, you know, a better contributing person at their job if their face is a little bit more youthful. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of weird psychological stuff out there that I wish wasn't the case. Um, but, but it is. And so if I can help someone feel a little bit better about themselves, then I will. Yeah. And, and along with that, it's like, we can be a part of the process of, and you see a lot of that that's happening right now, changing perceptions, changing belief systems, which also means not having any, any judgment on people who decide to go down a particular pathway. And the, and the highest hope, you know, we've done some uh, uh, podcast on uh, uh, breast implant illness, and it's both a combination of, hey, somebody can have, or if a guy chooses, let's say for Viagra, or whatever tool or anybody that wants to use to enhance some aspect of their life, they should have the right to be able to do it. And then we want to give them the most amount of information possible so that they can make the decision on what's right or wrong for them. Right. Yeah. I, I'm very much about, about letting people you know, decide for themselves and not being so rigid um, with any of this, whether that's with, you know, there's diet wars going on, you know, between yeah. the, you know, people and the vegans and the, you know, like there's all of these different wars and everyone gets very entrenched in like their own opinions about everything from, you know, politics to diet to Viagra. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's hard to know what someone else is going through unless you're that person. And so, you know, if we don't, if we're not that person, then I think we can't make those choices for them. Yeah. Focus on your business and uh, that's it. Nothing else matters. Yeah. And on that topic, uh, 
Amy, it's been fantastic to have you on and have you break down some of these things, especially in a category as I started off the podcast that can be a little tough for people to talk about. And you just have a way and a demeanor about you that is very heart centered and leading with education and demystification so that people don't feel ashamed really about talking about these things. So I want to thank you for uh, doing that. How can people follow you, find out more? And if they want to check out the clinic that, uh, that you're at. Um, well, first of all, thank you for saying all that. Um, <laughs> second of all, uh, so I'm very active on Instagram, Dr. Amy B. Killen. I do quite a bit of education on that. Um, uh, Facebook as well, but more Instagram. I have uh, several different websites. So probably the easiest one to get to is Dr. Amy Killen, MD. No. Dr. Amy Killen. I think it's just Dr. Amy Killen. I should know this. Uh, .com. And then uh, for, for stem cell specific questions, I also have another website called Docere Medical, which is D-O-C-E-R-E medical.com uh, that you can reach out to me there. But I have a lot of people who just message me on Instagram and, and kind of then I'll you know, route them to wherever the best resource is. Um, and you put a lot of really great videos and content out there. So if you're not following Amy on Instagram, you know, definitely click on the show notes below. You'll be able to, to, uh, to find her. If there's a, a last message that you want to leave people about in this topic of sexual health and pleasure, and just even the theme of experiencing pleasure in life in general, um, are there any final words that you want to leave people with, especially for the person who feels like they have been maybe putting themselves last or they haven't actually gone into the topic of pleasure and figured out what really brings them pleasure in life. And I'm not just talking about sexual, you know, uh, yeah. pleasure. I'm talking about all pleasure that's there. But what, what do you want to leave uh, a lasting message for that individual who's listening? You know, I think that the, the message is that you deserve pleasure. Like you deserve to feel good about yourself and all the things that, all the health benefits that come with pleasure and just the mental benefits and that, you know, this is something you deserve. And I think that it's possible. It does sometimes take a little work and education and experimentation and things like that, but the tools are out there um, now. And, and it's something that if you work at it, it it's something that usually happens uh, at least in some capacity and you deserve it. So, so go for it. Yeah, you deserve it and you can work on it. You can work on it, right? right. Uh, Amy, thank you again for being on the Broken Brain Podcast and being here with us and educating our listeners on this topic. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. 